Hi, everybody. Jose Palomino here with another episode of Business Growth on Purpose. And as you know, at Value Prop, we help businesses and business owners particularly get unstuck when they've hit a plateau in their growth, figure out what's really going on with why they're stuck, and then figuring out what to do about it. And one of the things we really love about uh, the guests we've had on this show is we bring in experts who really can speak to some things that are common stuck points. One of which is just getting leads, getting appointments with people that can buy from you. And our guest today, Jack Reamer of SalesBread, is just such an expert. So I want you to listen closely as Jack will share with us some real practical insights on how to get that flywheel turning if it's not turning the way you need it to right now. So let's continue with our episode of Business Growth on Purpose right now. Welcome, Jack, to Business Growth on Purpose. Thanks, Jose. Looking forward to our conversation. Absolutely. So, Jack, just for our audience to give a little context, uh, why don't you just tell us what you do and who you do it for? Sure thing. So B2B companies will use my strategy and team in order to generate leads. So the, the spiel I usually give is today, most B2B companies either lack the time or the expertise to turn those cold prospects, your dream clients into warm sales qualified leads. So at salesbread.com, we actually will bring companies, I say a lead a day, sometimes uh, markets that's really aggressive, but um, we send ultra personalized LinkedIn messages and some cold emails as well to basically take care of prospecting and outreach and copywriting and very importantly, personalization so that you and your you know BDRs just have to handle closing. Um, so really like every day we're knocking on doors and we're testing different approaches. And hopefully today we can get into what's working, what can SMBs do and, to and, break through. And, and I'm, I'm anxious to get into that because you, you hit on something, which is kind of the, the thought that effectiveness or effective tactics, strategies, and so on evolve over time. Yeah. And I, you know, I think when I started out reaching out to people on LinkedIn, you know, 15 years ago, whatever the early days, right. It was like the FedEx of emails. 15 like years ago. Early, early days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. And eight, I guess. So something that might have like been pre-Microsoft. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it was pretty, it was pretty cool. So that's what, okay. first, yeah, before Microsoft acquired LinkedIn. Absolutely. So at that time, uh, it was like the FedEx of email because it was special. And you really had to know like who's who that you actually could reference Joe, you know, uh, uh, Jack Reamer told me that I should yeah. reach out to you, that kind of thing. That's now right. it's so far on the other side that it's like buzzy noise. And most yes. of it, like, I checked out your profile and you look like a wonderful human being. <laughs> so can we talk? You're really so, putting a dent in the universe. Let's connect, right? <laughs> Let's connect. So it's so I'm just curious how. Fa Let me start with this. There's a question in there. The first question would be, how quickly are things changing that you have to pay attention to what's working, what's not? Or are there some things that, hmm. still, but regardless of how we might approach, do some yeah. things. There's some truths that are true forever. Right on. Okay. So Jose, the best way to think through this question is tactics change real quick on a weekly basis sometimes. And if like being concrete, uh, you used to be able to send almost an unlimited amount of connection requests on LinkedIn, not around the pandemic, right? right. Like 2020, Absolutely. 2020, there was really, it was still wild west. Um, and so the tactic du jour back then was send as many as possible. Don't even worry about like, making sure it's the right buyer. Don't even worry about how great the message is because you could send 200 a day. Right. So off you go. And then you're inevitably going to have a big list of connections that then you can deal with. Um, th that's an example of a tactic that changed pretty quickly. And now it's way different. But what stays the same is strategies, meaning who you reach out to, what you say, making sure that they have a need, that they have a budget, that your message is focused on them and their pain points, their challenges. Um, basically, uh, having a timing that it falls within their buying cycles. Those strategies withstand the test of time. And so, if you're lost, if you're, you know, uh, let's say 
you know, running a, a B2B company and you're just wondering what works right now, just take a breath, take a step back and think about what hasn't changed over the last hundred years in sales. And to me, that's like a very helpful place to start forming campaign ideas, regardless of when you're listening to the show and what channel, what thing is hot right now. Right. So, so you talk about leads, right? So even that word, and I've worked with many sales organizations, like on sales enablement initiatives, and just the idea of what is a prospect, what is a lead, what is an opportunity, when you convert this to that, and all the CRMs have this like conversion staircase that you go from X to Y to Z, and it's very fuzzy. What does it mean? Does it, you know, yeah. a past client that you, but we haven't talked to them in 18 months. Is that a lead? Is that a prospect? Yeah. Else? Okay. So just curious about how you categorize, how should, and let's limit this to the context of B2B business services being sold, like some industrial or business service. Yeah. So it's not a small ticket item. I need to get mm -hmm. a conversation with a general manager, a product, you know, somebody in production. How do I, you know, who are they? What, what, what buckets do they fall into? Yeah. It's a good question, Jose. I, I'm going to give a bad answer and then a more detailed, better answer. The bad answer is who cares what you really call them? The important thing is, are you speaking to the right kind of buyer in the right way, depending on where they are in the journey, how close they are to your company? So someone who worked with you two years ago deserves a different kind of touch, touches than someone who's an ice cold prospect. They look like a great fit, but they have never been exposed to your brand, your company, your message, you before. Okay, so here's the better, more detailed answer that I think um, you and the listeners are more interested in is, at what point do you consider a prospect to now become a sales qualified lead? All right, and what if you're using Pipedriver, HubSpot, um, yeah. there's different stages and it can get pretty complicated quickly, but I break it down into like, more of a, a bucket here, Jose, where I basically will look at a prospect and ask myself, are they qualified? Meaning, right industry, right size, right job title, right organization, right department size, wh whatever is important to the pre-sale. Do they check those boxes? Okay. Okay. Great. That's pretty easy to do. That so far, we haven't even um, required any engagement from this per from this prospect. Now, when that prospect replies to a, let's call it a sales message, even though I don't want to give the connotation that this is like, hi, I'm trying to sell you this. And, you know, are you interested? It, it, it may not be such an aggressive product focused message, you, but you want, you're looking for a hand raise of some kind. Exactly right. Perry Marshall calls it racking the shotgun right. where you're, you know, you expose the right buyer to either a pain focused message where is this uh, a priority right now that you're looking to solve? Um, and they've responded with interest. But like, let's go one step further, Jose, because I, I don't think that's enough. They have to respond with interest and know what you're selling. Okay, so I'll give you an example. Um, stop me if I'm starting to go a little bit too off course here, but I think it's important because I could reach out to an ideal buyer and I could say something like, Hey, you know, we're both in the Miami area working on FinTech. Um, would love to connect, grab a coffee sometime. If they say, sounds great. Sure. I've just set up a networking call where I don't know that there's purchase intent. And so I do not consider that a lead, um, because they don't know what I'm selling. I don't know if they struggle and have a budget for what I'm trying to solve. So, okay. so I basically laid out three things. They're the right buyer. They've expressed some level of interest and they know what we're selling here. So they're interested in how so we're- frame yeah. that, Because I know part of it, it sounds like you try, you're trying to frame things as a fairly non-confrontational, non-threatening request. I like, let's say get coffee together. Yeah. What you want with, by the way, I hate the coffee approach. I don't use it. Right. Okay. Um, I'm just, so... I'm just running with your example there, but, but it, it, let's say for whatever reason, I felt my strongest position was I want to get in front of somebody face to face over a cup of coffee. That's helped me for 20, 30, 40 years, whatever. Yeah. And if you're like differently, how do you, what? 
how would I get that invitation out differently so that if they said yes, it's because they know I'm there to sell them something. Perfect. I'll make it real easy. So uh, with the asterisk, knowing that this coffee campaign is almost never used because it's lacking the purchase intent, the, the transparency, if you will. Right. Here's how you can tighten it up. So by the way, if you're a business broker and you're you're selling a construction company who's making you know 20 million a year and you're you're looking to sell um, business insurance, the coffee campaign is probably not a bad idea. You need to meet more CEOs, right? right. So here's what I'd recommend. Look, we're both in the area, been around the industry, the construction space for decades. You know, love to meet you. For, you know, grab a coffee next time I'm in neighborhood. Um, how's how's next week looking for whatever? Just put a PS and says PS being transparent. I hope construction CEOs find better ways to save on their insurance overheads. But for right now, I'm just looking to meet you, learn more about your business, see where that goes. Right. So as like a really rough draft that explains what I'm selling so that if this CEO is using his brother-in-law as a business broker, they tell you like, Hey, I don't think there's something here, man. We're, I right. went to you know play football with my broker, like yeah, right. thank you. And they will say that because they appreciate the transparency. That's what I, we're seeing is like, notice we spell it out. We also threw in a little bit of a unique value prop where, you know, in this bad example, we're talking about saving money on, on find new ways to save money on a premium. But it also didn't feel like, hey, I want to be your broker. I want like, if you go too much on that route, it backfires. Right. So one of the things about outreach generally, right? There's two things, right? Certainly people getting on the phone to call people that don't, that, well, we don't know them, right? The classic definition of a cold call, call. right? Uh, most people would rather have a root canal without anesthesia, right? I mean, it's just the nature. <laughs> then right? to dial or, or take the call, then <laughs> to dial, right? <laughs> it's just painful, right? Yeah. So yeah, for the dialing part, the taking the call part. Yeah, yeah. Not yeah, as, yeah, but not as bad, right? So, so there's such a like I think there's a psychology to even picking up the phone. I've worked with sometimes mm. a struggling owner, and I have to say literally, literally say pick up the phone. You have to, you know, you yeah. have these people that you did business with in the last two years. You're struggling right now. Just yeah. say these words like hi, you know this. We did this order for you 18 months ago. Do you need any more of this or something similar? How can I be helpful? Right. How can I help you? And yeah. at the worst case scenario is that I don't need anything. And that, that's going to happen. It's going to be probably 90%. I'm not even saying that's yeah. sophisticated what I'm saying. I'm simply saying sure, sure, sure. there's a psychology to that. So how do you how do you deal with the the need to maintain, especially if you're calling higher up? Yeah. More people with greater authority, greater financial authority. How do you maintain rapport in a world where people just want to hang up on people? And would rather not be called by somebody they don't know. Mm -hmm. So I think we're talking about two two things here. So there's an example of picking up the phone and calling your your client you worked with two years ago because the business is down. You need to make things happen. I think that's a great idea, Jose. Like I I, I think as a tangent, we talk about cold outreach, and we're very interested in turning prospects into into leads and reaching out to great buyers that have never heard of you. But the reality is right now, there's two phone calls you could make today that will probably land you one deal in the next six months. And right. it's because the, you've already spoken to them. They had a great three calls and they kind of had fade into the mist. You know, those two people, if you just pause this podcast and call them, that's a very uh, high value use of your time. So don't forget about your low hanging fruit as we talk about the uh, cold, uh, realm of of sales. Okay. And then there's another area where it's like, there's a psychological block that prevents us from doing this. Hey, how are you? We, we work together to you. And, th and that deserves like a bit of a, of a dialogue here because uh, are you familiar with rejection therapy? Uh, not, not explicitly, but I, I can kind of imagine what, <laughs> how you get there. You, you get hung up on 150 times and your skin becomes three times thicker. You're gonna have rhino okay. sales skin. And okay. um, there's one other, there's two other hacks that I have if you're listening and you're like, 
dealing with this rejection psychology. Um, one's good, one's even better. So uh, the first one is inspired from a book called Go For No. It's okay. like this long. There's like 90 pages. And I'll summarize it in a sentence. When you do cold call, cold outreach, reframe your goal from getting three meetings to getting 97 go to hell, right? If you aim every morning for, I'm going to get 97 people to say, get lost, dude. Then every bad call becomes a step closer to hitting your goal that day. It's a oh. weird tweak. I don't know. I get it. That sounds good. It's not, I yeah. mean, it's not, and it's the, the proportions are about right. I mean, that's just, yeah. Right. <laughs> and so pursue that. And it kind of feels, it feels good. Um, and, and remember there's math that backs up this weird idea of go for a no. It's like when you get 97 no's, you will get one meeting and we want meetings, but we have to get through 90. So, and anyway, uh, and there's one other, uh, suggestion I have, especially if you're the CEO of this company, um, don't do it. So basically have like, if you hate rejection, you, your sales team is going to be there for you. You do, you actually don't have to go through it. And maybe your mid-level manager, maybe you're managing the, the, a small sales team. One of my favorite uh, approaches is design the campaign, be involved in the prospecting list, be involved in everything except for the reply handling. So I actually pay somebody um, that their only job is to review the responses from the campaign. And I only get exposed to stats and the interested conversations, gotcha. the interested good replies. And this uh, is sort of like it puts a wall between rejection and you. So you can get the stats you need to make good decisions without being feeling rejected. Wow. It's like my favorite That's hack. Interesting. I, uh, for about the last 10 years, I, I teach a graduate course at Villanova called Entrepreneurial Marketing, right? Developed it for that program. And it's been great. I, I do it once a year because it's like seven or eight nights a year that I have to commit to. So that makes traveling during that time a little bit challenging and so on. So I've done that for all that period of time. And, you know, probably a few hundred students have gone through. But generally, when they do the scoring after the class, so every teacher gets evaluated, right? You get like all these fives, the greatest class, uh, really a lot of fun and so on. But every now and then, I'll get one in the same class that says, the com a complete waste of time, the worst <laughs> I ever took in my graduate studies. I don't even know why they offer it. It was literally... Uh -huh. Right. And, and so the point is, I'm a mature professional. I've been around the block a, a few times. All right. And and yet it's it can knock you out. And you, and you start thinking about who was that person? How do I persuade mm -hmm. them that I'm actually worthy? Did I lose my mojo? Right. <laughs> like that. So it's an mm -hmm. interesting thing. And I, I love the process of you could have somebody else make the calls you know, sift it down and so on. But but let me let me flip that a little bit because there are people listening perhaps that are more the only owner rainmaker on the staff. There is no staff person, right? Mm -hmm. And they say, boy, I got to get on the phone and so on. Is there a situation where being the principal of a firm that if you're calling for business, you lose stature relative to the prospect you're trying to reach? Hmm, that's interesting. So on LinkedIn, it's a little different. If you are the principal, the CEO, as the face of the campaign, and by the way, like my company sales spread, we act on behalf of our client. And this is important because sometimes we work with a smaller company and say, look, we want you to be the CEO so that it looks like the CEO is doing this outreach. Right. Other times to say, all right, you're going to work with Andrew. He's the SDR. Um, and Andrew will be the face of the campaign. And we can see stats on what happens when a CEO sends the exact same connection requests and follow-up messages compared to an SDR title? Uh, I think you know probably the answer. Uh, if you want to take a guess, you're welcome to, or I could just go straight into I'll it. I'll go straight into the, it. The winner by far is a CEO has better connection rates. We all want to know more CEOs. They also have uh, better reply rates. I'm going to say roughly 20% uh, more connections Ditto wow. for 20% more replies. So for LinkedIn outreach, I think it's in your favor to send from a more senior title, okay? Cold calling, I don't know. And I do think that that seems a little bit um, 
of a discounted position. I probably wouldn't say as a CEO of the company, I'm calling you up. There's one exception. Okay. And so um, I'll get to the exception shortly, but the idea is you're the CEO of the firm. You're taking time out of a Monday morning to do cold calls. Something's up. This ain't right. You know, I think. Right. Exactly. Right. There you go. So the one exception is if you have a campaign and you notice that someone has replied, hey, you know, great to meet you. Would, would love to meet up for that coffee. And a couple of messages have been sent with no luck scheduling something. That's different. Then the CEO can pick up, say, hey, we were talking last week about setting up a meeting. It's, it's you know, Jack from Salesbread. I, I, I want to make sure that this seems interesting. You know, would love to hear more. How's this week looking? I feel like that's a much different scenario, meaning as long as you're not doing true blue cold calling, I love when CEOs or VPs, director levels, are doing the outreach as opposed to more junior employee. Okay, no, but yeah. that, that makes that makes a lot of sense, and it, because it's, you know, it's 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 interesting. Like a lot of times, how you position on on hello changes everything from it sets the trajectory of that whole conversation and that whole relationship from that point on. And it's a very it's much so very challenging to to elevate if you've if you've already lost a few steps. It's right. So let, let's talk about cold calling one a, a little bit more. And mind you, sales bread is not a cold calling front. Like we, we don't do it. Um, I think it it really is the the harder way to go about um, getting a lot of these sales conversations going. But that's you know maybe a side conversation. Here's how I do like warm calling at sales bread. We have a email list. If you're listening and you're like, put me on it. Just go to sales bread and go to that. You know you'll see a pop up throw your email in. And here's what I do. When we send in emails each week, some people engage like crazy with them. I see that they've been open 10, 12, 4. I'm sure you see the same thing, Jose. We're like, wow, it looks like this founder, this CEO must have forwarded my email internally. Something I said here really resonated. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so when I see that, I get a trigger. I said, all right, this account that has been pre-qualified by someone on my team, open this message 14 times. If I see something crazy like that, and, and I like to see that they clicked it more than once, I'll say, all right, Dave's getting a call from me. I'm going to pick up the phone, look, go to the website, look at the you know company thing. You know, hey, it's Jack from Sales Break. I speak to Dave. Dave, it's Jack. I, look, you know, just being clear, I, it looks like uh, you or someone on your team enjoyed the last email I sent about sales outreach. Just wanted to check in. Can I be helpful? Can I elaborate on anything? Do you have any questions? And that half the time that is like, okay, we, we're so glad you called because you know my sales guy was, and that to me feels like a, a much more productive way to use uh, the phone to keep conversations going as opposed sure. to doing it where Dave didn't know me. That, that's an uphill battle. I'm going to stack the deck in my favor and, and make a cold call fun. Right. No, that no. sounds like that. That sounds like it makes a whole lot of sense. And yeah, well, well, Jack, listen, we we could obviously keep talking about this for a while, right? We just yeah. scratched the surface on it, but we, we are yeah. at, at time for now. But but Jack, uh, for our listeners who I'm sure are interested in learning more about you and what you do, where should they go to to connect with you or to find out more about what you're yeah. offering? Best thing to do is head over to salespread.com. There, you're going to see more articles. You see our contact page if you're so inclined. And like I said, you'll see where to sign up for the email. That's salesbread.com. And that's the best starting point. Fantastic. Jack Greenman, thank cool. you so much for joining us here at Business Growth on Purpose. We appreciate it. It was a great conversation. Uh, thanks so much, Jose. Thanks for listening to another episode of Business Growth on Purpose. If you like the show, hit subscribe and leave us a review to help other people find the podcast. And if you're ready to take the next step in driving intentional growth for your business, come check out what we're doing at valueprop.com. We've developed industry-leading programs and systems to help B2B owners take control of their growth. Until then, thanks for listening to another episode of Business Growth on Purpose.